That was uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's proposed second Bill of Rights. That was filmed after he delivered his State of the Union address via radio on January 11, 1944. Sadly, he died shortly after that, and the Bill of Rights never came to fruition. I think that's also what this funeral here is about. Uh, do you, do you? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are going to march with a New Orleans funeral style procession in honor of the dearly departed middle class of this country. So I'm glad everyone's gathered here to join us. We're going to walk across the street, down the block, so we have maximum visibility and support our fellow 99 percenters throughout the green of Guilford, all the way down to the end, then make a right turn down to the library where we'll have eulogies for the middle class. So welcome all. We are the 99%. We welcome everyone, we, nay, we exhort everyone to please grab a kazoo or a musical instrument. Or, um, we are here to mourn the loss of our economic security and we need to make a lot of noise to let the evil spirits know they will not take any more souls. So, my dearly beloved fellow 99 percenters, we gather here today to pay tribute to the dead and dying middle class of this country. This is a time of great sadness for our country, but this winter of our discontent leads into a springtime of renewal, renewal of spirit. So it is that we stand here united, vowing to usher in the light of hope, the warmth of spring, and the second coming of the middle class. We will rekindle the eternal hope that this country was founded on, that is, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this, too, the government of the people, 99%, by the people, 99%, and for the people, 99% shall not perish from this earth. We are the 99%. We are the 99%. We are the 99%.
As the applicant's address, peaceful First Amendment demonstrations, including holding signs and group speaking, is the stated purpose. About 50 Occupy DC protesters join activists from around the country on top of a hill and take back the capital. My heartfelt condolences to the family and friends of the middle class. The middle class, a good friend of mine, someone who these last 30 years has been overlooked, stepped on, and, well, tragically, you know the result. <laughs> yes, there are plenty of people in Washington looking out for the billion dollar corporations. My life's work has been fighting for the middle class, taking on big banks, putting forward new ideas such as c consumer regulations, putting in new banking regulations. Dearly beloved, I am here today to let you know what I think is fighting for. I want to help, if it's at all possible, resuscitate the middle class, a middle class that I'm afraid we have lost. You know, we got into this whole $2 trillion debt on two wars that we put on a credit card for our children and grandchildren to pay off. And we got into this whole $1 trillion on a Medicare drug program that A, was not paid for, and B, is 40% more expensive than it needs to be because it was a giveaway to the drug company. So, I mean, that's just $4 trillion right there. So part of the way you solve these problems is you don't do these things. It hurts, well, it kills the middle class. You know, I hear all this, well, you know, this is class warfare. All this Occupy stuff going on along the shoreline. Well, you know, I hear it's a lot of whining. Those are a bunch of whiners, you know. This is whatever. No. 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 Nobody in this country got rich on his own. You built a factory out there? Well, good for you. But I want to be clear. You moved your goods to market on the road. You hired workers. The rest of us paid to educate. And you were safe in your factory because of police forces and fire forces that the rest of us paid for. You didn't have to worry about marauding bands would come and seize everyone at your factory and, and you didn't have to hire someone to protect against this because of the work the rest of us, the middle class, did. Yay! Now look, you built a factory and it turned into something terrific. Or a good idea. Well, God bless. Keep a big hunk of it. But part of the underlying social contract is that you take a hunk of that and pay forward for the next kid that comes along. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. God bless. Keep up the good fight. Occupy Shoreline. This is something that they published from a man who was the ambassador to the United States from Mexico from 2000 to 2003. And that must have been a very bad experience because you remember who was in office then. <laughs> George Bush too. It's called What Latin America Can Teach Us. And it's long and you can get it. It's just a couple of weeks old. But it says the following. No nation has ever lost an existing middle class. And the United States is not in danger of that yet. 
but the percentage of national income held by the top 1% of Americans went from 10% in 1980 to 24% in 2007. <coughs> and that is a worrisome signal. So before the United States continues in its current road of dismantling its version of the welfare state, God bless the welfare state. Wish it was more complete. Okay. God bless the welfare state. That's a, you know, I'm tired of what the, what the new Democratic Party in Canada calls socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. Because that's the system that we have. They got bailed out. We got sold out. If the American middle class withers, what will America look like? Well, what America, what Latin America used to look like. <laughs> and in some way still struggles to stop being. So there are two questions. Does the, does the United States really want to look like what Latin America used to look like? And is there a lesson to be learned from its neighbors to the south that once inequality becomes entrenched, reversing it becomes increasingly difficult? His basic question, you can get the article, his basic question is, why is the United States a country that has been a model for other countries in terms of its middle class development? Why would we disestablish these programs that have allowed a large part of the population to be middle class? Why on earth would we do this? Why would anyone do this? They're going in the direction of attempting to of attempting to have a middle class structure with proper social supports, but it's being deconstructed in the United States. Why? Why? Well, as George Carlin says, those greedy bastards want every last cent. <laughs> and the next thing they're coming for is your social security. Oh, yeah. They want every last cent. They're taking it back. I don't know if you've seen this wonderful routine that Carla did shortly before his death. Yes. But what he did is he compressed into about five minutes. It's not a comic routine. It's a horrible bare knuckle reality. What he said is the current political system maintains the illusion of choice. You do not have choice. You have owners. You have a class of people who own practically everything. They control the political system. It doesn't make any difference what you call them. We used to call them capitalists. Sometimes we would call them the master class. But they are greedy and they are rapacious and they are in complete control of the political system. And unless we resist, they resist strongly. They resist with solidarity. This system will continue. And if it continues, quite frankly, people will be dying in the streets of hunger. Yes, they will. Okay? They're already doing it. We call them homeless people. Yeah. Oh. And veterans. What about people living on less than $2 a day? With people the money dries up from the middle class. People living on less than $2 a day. It will be cheaper to kill than to feed. An article in the New York Times, our sometimes ally, from a couple of days ago. General Electric and the auto companies are moving back into St. Louis. Do you know why? Because the wages have been driven down to half of what they were before. Whereas Chinese wages and Indian wages and wages of the rest of the world are rising. Now here is a terrible fact that they try to keep from people. Economists, international economists have found out something about the effects of globalization. Globalization will reliably reduce the inequality between nations, but will reliably increase it within each nation within each nation. That's right. That is to say, we are all reaching the same level. Bangladesh and the United States. The working people of Bangladesh, the working people of the United States are facing a similar enemy. And I gotta tell you, they are the same enemy. They get together, they have G8s, they have these things. But I didn't want you to think I was gloating. I actually had a long relationship with middle class. Despite all the screwing, it wasn't what you're thinking. And I will get it here. Hey, we're going to be one to the struggle. You are one. That they think you no know longer need to protect yourself. Frankly, I wasn't sure I was ready to make a move. My hero, I soon figured out how we could keep all the pride for ourselves.
good old class with the club. Supreme Court decisions, though, it was a lot worse. I know a lot of corporations were even inhibited about speaking in public like I am now. Just to show how old we corporations have become right now, I'd like to I hope someday soon you'll all feel comfortable coming out about your status. I understand how you feel though. A few years ago, I was scared to tell my parents I was a corporation. Finally, one night around 2 o'clock, I called and blurted it out. There was silence and finally dad just broke down and cried. Then he admitted that, to me that he was a corporation too. After we talked a while, he confessed that my sister and brother weren't my natural siblings, but were actually acquired in some kind of stock swap. <laughs> Still, I've had to put up with people saying a lot of ugly things about my people. You think they would have more respect for the Constitution and the inalienable rights I enjoy under it. A beloved member of society died slowly over the last 30 years after a long battle with special interests, corporate greed, political corruption, and the extraction of wealth by an elite group of already obscenely wealthy citizens. The official cause of death in the coroner's report was death by protracted oligarchic asphyxiation by means of the 1%. A time of death A time of death could not be determined because no one seemed to be paying attention when the middle class actually was strangled to death. I'm so, so immensely grateful and glad that we are here doing what we are doing. And it's very disheartening to me to have my friends say, we have watched Occupy scatter to the winds in Philadelphia. Philadelphia! Philadelphia, the city that was once our nation's capital, that was a bedrock of the American Revolution. So I said, I will go back to Connecticut and I will tell the people assembled that they have a lot of power. Because my friends are people like myself We've made vast concessions to this society. We are by and large educated, some of us not, some of us have masters, and I've conceded, I've conceded everything that I can think of this year, this very year. I've lost my job three times in four years. I've conceded higher education. I've conceded home ownership. I've conceded having a child because I've also lost health care. No insurance, three years running, because I've been denied by starve. Yeah. And I can't believe, and I'm shocked, and I'm outraged, that this discussion is happening in my lifetime. Yeah. So I resolve, I resolve in 2012 to come back from the dead, because that's where we are, for no other reason than that this cannot be happening. It's been 30 years. I resolved to end the 30 years war of propaganda on our lives. It's over. Ronald Reagan died when I was a child. Let's fucking bury it. So if any of you have any New Year's resolutions, please come and we'll mic check them. So mic check. Mic check. I resolve. I resolve. Generations. Justice! Justice! Equality! Equality!